Hey y'all, it's Steve, Hobo with Wood. This is going to be a short one. Got a lot of questions about my inlay techniques, about crosshatch, flood fill, line after fill. What are those? Why am I doing them? So just a real quick uh, demonstration and show you what I've got. So uh, let's take a look at a sample board I did here today. This is a pine round that I make the uh, Lazy Susans out of, and I've got several different test patterns here. This one is a, both of these top ones actually were done with my CO2. This was a single pass, and this was a cross hatch. And you can see the difference here. Now these four squares here I actually took my dental tool and actually scraped away to get the loose particles out of there. And if you see how that's just peeling away, now yeah, I'm scraping at it, but my concern is whenever there's any loose debris that's loose enough like this, uh, that's going to be a deterrent when you're doing inlays. You know, I don't, I don't know how well of an adhesion you're going to get when you're gluing to stuff that can be lifted out of there quite so easily. This is with the diode. This is a single pass with a 10 watt Comgo Z1. And I feel you've know, got better results there, you know, with using the diode for doing the inlays. Cleaner more consistent burns I found a sweet spot here and then come over and did some crosshatch test now this is the same Comgo 10 watt Z1 with a crosshatch and this is the same test with the crosshatch line after fill followed by a flood fill with the Comgo 10 watt Z1 can you see the difference between this one and this one. This is so clean. I don't have any fears of gluing any inlays in there and it not wanting to stick properly. This is why I do the flood fill when I do my inlays. It takes just a few more minutes on the laser, but I get a cleaned and prepped surface ready to take my inlay. We're in light burn. And if you're not aware, underneath your laser tools menu, you'll find next to the bottom here, your material test. Now the material test is the test that I use to determine what power and speed settings I need to generate the depth of engraving I need to use for a given inlay. This is also the test I run on all new materials to find my optimum settings for each new material. But if I'm working with my diode laser, I'm going to come in here. And my first test is going to be at usually at 10 millimeters a second and 100% power, or 100, 10 millimeters a second up to 100 millimeters per second. This first column it defaults to speed, but you can change all of these different settings here. But typically it defaults to speed and power unless you change it. But I do 10 millimeters a second, 100, and a max of 100 millimeters a second. You can change the number of counts in your grid as well. I, I do a 10 by 10 initially. Power at 10 to 100. And if you preview, there's what you see. Now that gives me a good starting grid to find my sweet spots and then I can start fine tuning that. But I take it a step further. When I'm doing my inlays, the depth of the engraving is what's most important. And also I want a good clean, valley pocket whenever I'm done. So I find my sweet spot on the engraving initially, then I want to edit it and I'm going to turn all these off so we can work our way back up to these so you don't get confused. All right, so when I first do 
that test. It is strictly a bi-directional feel. You don't have to change any of the settings here on the speed and power because that's what the test is going to do. But you can affect the engraving style of the bi-directional feel, the crosshatch, and so on. But to find your true base, you want to do a bi-directional feel test and then uh, find that sweet spot, and then you can start fine-tuning it. And the reason I do a cross hatch is because the grains of the wood and your between your your pulp wood and and the grain you'll find that some of it burns deeper than others and when you're doing just a bi-directional feel you can get some really high lows in those pockets i've found that when you do a cross hatch by running it vertical uh, opposing directions uh, it helps to break up that heavy grains in there and gets a much more unified pocket when I do this way so when I found my sweet spot I will go back add a cross hatch now that's still on one layer of layer double O but two burns horizontal and vertical but then you hear me say I do a line after feel well, there's your feel, that's sub-layer one and layer double O. Hit your plus mark over here, and that creates another sub-layer. There's sub-layer two. I leave it in line mode, and I come back and use a very, not a very, I use a much lower power, because I don't really need to cut any deeper. I'm just looking to take now and refine the edges of whatever it is I'm engraving. In this case, it's a grid. But this gives it a very fine chiseled edge around the perimeter of your inlay, your script, your, your images, whatever you're putting on there. And then for the final step, I add another sublayer. I change it to fill. Then you come over here, you've got common and advanced tabs. Common is what you see as a default. Go to your advanced settings and use flood fill. Enable that and say OK. So now that gives you the cross hatch with a line after fill, fill followed by the flood fill. And that's where I get such a very clean and defined pocket for my inlays. If we look at the preview here, all right, so there you're doing your first horizontal scan. Now I should turn around and do the vertical. Line after fill. There we go. And now there you go. And there's your flood fill. Your flood fill is the last pass, uh, again, going back and forth horizontally. What is different between that flood fill and just the regular fill? Well, let me demonstrate for you in a hopefully an easy to understand simulation. If we take a, a square rectangle and let's check and see where our settings are at and make sure everything's, yeah, flood fill's off. We're in regular fill, bi-directional fill. And the estimated time for this, undo. I don't mean to do that. I meant to select it. <clears throat> there we go. The estimated time to engrave that is 17 minutes and 8 seconds. 17 minutes and 8 seconds. But let's say we come in here and we do an offset of that. And we want to select the whole thing. Preview. It's still 17 minutes and 8 seconds. But we're only engraving the perimeter. So how can we make that better that's where flood fill comes into play if I come over here and go into my advanced settings turn that to flood fill and say okay make sure everything is selected preview we were at 17 minutes and 8 seconds before 1 minute and 57 seconds now the reason for that is is if we go back let's turn our flood fill off and we look at our preview again 
there's 17 minutes and eight seconds and you see all those traversal moves. That's where that laser is now moving completely left to right entire body of that re square rectangle until it's complete. So all of this is wasted movement, wasted energy, and wasted time. When we go to flood fill, where are the traversal moves? It says they're turned on, but you don't see any. Why? Because this is how it gets engraved does all of the bottom then once it reaches the top of that it, once it starts moving uh, upward it continues on up until it runs out and it goes back and picks up and finishes that off now <clears throat> when you're doing flood fill if you were actually engraving an image it can sometimes give you unwanted results if you were actually doing this for your initial engraving so I don't use flood fill except for in cases like this where I am using it to clean out a pocket. Because my engraving has been done. Now all I'm doing is cleaning out that pocket. So I'm not worried about what it's going to do in the way of irregular burn patterns because I'm using a very, very low power, com relatively speaking, compared to the rest of the engraving. And I'm only using it as a means to pressure wash those pockets out. So that pattern is irrelevant. And by doing that, it's able to minimize the traversal moves and cut down a ton of time. Otherwise, you have just engraved that uh, image three or four times with the cross hatch. As that's one, two with vertical, horizontal, then vertical is two. Then you do your line and then you come back with a, a, another feel. That would be three times you're doing that whole image. And if it was 15 minutes per image, that's 45 minutes. But if you can use flood fill and cut that down to where a 15 minute burn is now two minutes. And all you're doing is just using it for cleaning purposes. You're crazy not to use flood fill. So there's a brief explanation of my cross hatch line after fill followed by flood. Now, I use, <clears throat> I use my test patterns to find that sweet spot that's my initial single pass engraving. And when I say it's the sweet spot, it's an extremely clean area. There's not a lot of heavy burn or soot. It's just a very nice, clean, defined burn. But it's not deep enough. I need that to be deeper. I need it to be twice as deep. That's why I do the crosshatch, because this was a single pass bi-directional fill. So now by doing it on a cross hatch, it's bi-directional horizontally and then bi-directional vertically. Okay? So now that doubles the depth of this burn so I can use my plunge gauge on this test and get its initial depth and if it's, you know, one millimeter, which is exaggerated, but if it's one millimeter, a cross hatch is going to get me close to two millimeters. So I can use this test to determine where my sweet spot is. And that's why I did, this is a 10 by 10. And this was a three by three. And I only did this for your purposes here. So you can see what flood fill does. Cause that's the only difference, uh, between these two burns. They were both the cross hatches, and the line after feel is just a chiseled line around the edge. That has no effect on the actual cleanliness. So the flood feel is why that looks as good as it does. Okay, so hopefully that clears up a few questions. Uh, and I, it, I apologize for not being as clear in some of the videos because I don't think about the fact that a lot of you are just seeing this for the first time, seeing me hobo for the first time or two. You haven't been following along through my progression in the last six months as I've been learning Lightburn. And that's all I've been doing this is six months. So I've still got a long way to go before I have a complete handle on this. But some of the tips and tricks that I learn, I have shared and I've failed to realize that, well, you may not have seen the video where I explained those tips and tricks 
uh, tricks. So, uh, and I and I try to keep my videos as short and concise as possible. Sometimes that's really hard for me. Thank you for watching. Thank you to, to the subscribers. Thank you to the Patreons. If you'd like to help contribute to the channel, keep these projects going. 100% uh, of the funds on Patreon goes to keeping all the projects going, all the supplies, uh, and continue to learn these these techniques and, and projects together. Uh, Patreon.com slash Hobo with Wood. Any support would be greatly appreciated. So until the next video, I'm Steve, Hobo with Wood, and I'm out.